you might have noticed that the drum beat was different this time. You see, normally I use the drum beat from the original Yoshi's Island, but a month ago a new set of Mario Kart courses was released, which included one fully inspired by that game, and it included a new drum beat. Love that course. It might be my favorite Mario Kart course of all time. Anyway, I like the original drum beat better, so I'll continue to use that one going forward, but I figured I'd use the new one just once. Anyway, enough talk about that. This is an Owl House video. We got the 55 minute finale with no commercials, though you can still very easily tell where the commercials would be. I can't believe this show is already over. Oh man. Don't cry because it's over. Smile because it happened. So if we take the first word of each episode of the season, we get thanks for watching. But if we take the whole titles and put them in the order 3, 2, 1, we get watching and dreaming for the future, thanks to them. That's even more clever. It might not be intentional, but if it is, that was Galaxy Brain moment. Oh my titan, how true that is both in-universe and in the real world. This show is one of the things that made me want to become an artist, made me want to become an animator, made me want to create something special, just like this. Spoilers, 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 obviously, I shouldn't even have to say it, but if you have not watched the outhouse finale, watching and dreaming, get off this video, come back after you've watched it. You pretty much have to be in I don't feel safe mode in all times. I felt just like I did four years ago seeing Avengers Endgame on opening night. I can't even process these feelings right now. As a whole, the episode felt maybe a little bit too similar to the amphibia finale, but that's not a bad thing. The episode begins with the Collector immediately capturing everyone but Luz. She hears the Titan talking to her, telling her to wake up. She wakes up in the Emperor's throne room wearing Bellos' clothes, and my immediate reaction to seeing that in the promo was, I don't like this! She's with Stringbean, the castle's empty, she goes outside and sees everyone petrified. This is the beginning of her worst nightmare, and it just continues from there. Amity's outside the castle and tells Luz that everything's her fault, she's just like Bellos, you know, the whole shtick that Luz fears the most. Amity's eyes are dull and lifeless, like how Bellos' eyes are usually drawn. I didn't pick up on this at first, but after a certain moment in the episode, it's very obvious on a rewatch. Anyway, they start to fight, but it cuts to Ida. She wakes up in the conformatorium, she goes into harpy mode, flies out, gets hit by a net. She's captured by Coven guards, led by Lilith, her mom is there, she sees her dad who's like, I forgave you. Of course, Ida's biggest fear is all the hurt she's caused, that she's just a beast. King wakes up surrounded by Titan Skulls on Titan Trapper Island, Bill is there with truly empty eyes. Says he saved the best spot for him. Back to Luz. Luz finds Willow near some memory trees. She says her happiness was destroyed by Luz. She finally thought her future would be going somewhere, but now she'll never have that future. She'll never see her family again. Gus appears in his Grom outfit. He puts on a show calling Luz a hypocrite. Everyone helped her, but because of her, the gang won't see their families again. Hunter mourns Flapjack, who's a mountain in the background. Hunter lost his palisman to save Luz. Why does Luz get to have one when he doesn't? Amity challenges Luz to a witch's battle. And Luz immediately picks up on that and is like, no, 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 it is a witch's duel, Amity would never misquote Azura. Just as the gang tries to attack Luz, they wake up from their trance, they're all connected to strings, and their eyes become more complete. They say that they've been collected and Luz has to wake up if she wants to save everyone. She has to turn on the light, Amity gives Luz a light glyph, which makes her wake up. How fitting that the very first magic that Luz learned will be the most important one in the end. It's the most basic spell in existence, but simplicity is sometimes what you need. Luz wakes up on a big cube filled with big games. She sees Ida and King being psychologically tormented in their dreams and frees them. With the light glyph, the three of them get on their knees and have a big emotional reunion. So nice. The Collector was there watching them dream. Ooh, the title. They're mad that Rain's plan didn't work and they didn't want to hurt King. The Collector tells Rain that King is a Titan and that the Titan heart is connected to the whole island. And Bellas gets an idea, you know, what if the Collector plays with them in person? Which of course serves as a perfect distraction for Bellas to go off and do evil shit. He shoves Francois aside. How dare he? Albert's okay. We haven't seen him for several episodes, but he's alive and well. He and Stringbean have a little bonding moment. I think I, think I just hit one of the kings, I'm sorry. The Collector comes down and is like, why are you choosing them over me, King? It's very clear that they don't see that what they're doing is bad. They don't understand what death truly means. They're like toys break all the time, you can put them back together. Meanwhile, Bellos is so corrosive that he actually stops the puppet spell on Rain. Rain is a true witch again, they fight back, but Bellos remains in control. The Hex Squad are up in the archives as puppets, so that fake screenshot managed to be a perfect prediction. Like, the specific pose of the screenshot I don't recall seeing in the episode, so I'm gonna say that it was fake, but it looked very accurate. Anyway, the Amity puppet is twitching a little. 
In general, the Hexwad doesn't do a whole lot in this episode, it's mainly about the core trio. Side note, I didn't make the connection back when For the Future aired, but was the Puppeteer Demon in Episode 2 foreshadowing for the Collector puppet-fying everyone? Maybe. The Collector plays deadly games with Luzi and King, Pac-Man and Marbles and Jenga. After Jenga, the Collector gets real sad and lets them go and starts crying. He's just a little baby. Luz is like, you know, this can't last forever, is this what you truly want? Ultimately, what the Collector wants most is a friend who won't lie. The other collectors, the Archivists, made him play hide and seek on the Boiling Isles. He played with the baby titans, but the Archivists were scared of titan powers, so they killed them all. The last titan, the king's dad, thought the collector was the one who did it and trapped them, seemingly sacrificing himself in the process. I don't know exactly where the titan trappers fit into this, but they were there somewhere. King and Luz and Ida know what it's like to be alone and misunderstood. Lou still has the memory photo, so she starts to tell the Collector her story. Bellows arrives at the castle, Rain uses a bard spell to send him out of them, but he just crawls away and starts falling apart. Bellows incapacitates Rain in the throne room and crawls up to the Titan's heart. Rain uses another spell to block Bellows, but a single piece makes it to the heart, and that's all he needed. Bellows goop and eyes start growing everywhere, and yeah, he's just possessing the entire f***ing boiling aisles. You might as well go all out, right? <laughs> I don't like this! You know, I've gotten a lot of mileage out of that one clip of Ludo. Amity draws a light glyph and frees herself and Willow and Gus and Hunter. They all wake up surrounded by the puppets, including Camilla. Luz, Ida, and King take the Collector to the Owl House. Ida didn't know it got trashed, so that was a big surprise for her. Luz tells the Collector about how she arrived and met her found family. They decided not to fit in together. They go to Hexide and see the Grudgery Field. King is like, uh, Grudgery's a stupid game with stupid rules, and Ida's like, hey, it was all we had back in the day. Matt and Gerbo and Selene are there watching. Collector is like, hey guys, wanna play Grudgeby? And scares them away. They go to the knee, Luz draws an ice glyph. Collector notes that, you know, not everyone can recognize Titan magic. The Titan must really like Luz. Did you make the Titan be your friends? Did you force him? And Luz is like, no, no, that's not how it works. Sometimes people need kindness and forgiveness. And Collector's like, hmm. Kindness and forgiveness. Hmm. This gets interrupted by breathing and rumbling all throughout the aisles. The Titan's eye glows blue, that Bellows goop spread even more all over the place. He says he'll cleanse the entire aisles in one fell swoop. He becomes some sort of Titan dragon. The Collector finds Rain's earring on the ground and they fly over to Bellows. Bellows, all you need is kindness and forgiveness. We can all be buddies together. That is not what Luz had in mind, but. Good attempt. Bell just doesn't care and fires a deadly breath at the Collector. Luz takes the blow and turns to weird petrifying Bellow's stone and just fades away into particles of light. WHY DOES THIS KEEP HAPPENING?! Obviously this felt a lot like Amphibia, but it also reminded me of the Good Place finale with like how people exit the afterlife and kinda just dissolve into light. Luz literally is light in more ways than one. These particles fly past Hexide, they fly up to the archives, and Camilla's puppet starts crying. The Collector tries to bring Luz back and doesn't know why Luz won't come back. They know what death is now, although Luz didn't really die. I don't know if this is like the Anne situation where it's like, oh yeah, you technically died, but I cloned you, so you're good. Or if Luz just went into another form. Uh, they're kind of ambiguous about that. The King and Ida go all feral and attack Bellows together in rage. Meanwhile, one of those light glyphs lands in the in-between realm and Luz reappears there. Luz is like, oh, I should have thanked them in my last moments instead of just saying that we're going to be separated again. Anyway, the Titan, aka Papa Titan, grabs her and pulls her up. He's a cool dude. He's got glyph pants and a bad girl coven t-shirt and a hoodie thing coming out of his eye. This raises a whole lot of questions about what hoodie is. Is he part of the Titan that broke free? Is he some sort of Titan pet? Did Papa Titan just put a hoodie thing in his eye because he thinks hoodie is cool? Did he remove his eye and grant it life? Who knows? I know Hootie's origins are one of the things that would have been properly addressed on the show had it got a full third season, so all we can do is speculate, I guess. Or maybe they'll mention it in like a post-hoot or something. Papa Titan has been stuck in the in-between for quite some time, but he can keep an eye on King and those who've been kind to him. He regrets what he did to the Collector, he was willing to do anything to save his son, but he attacked the wrong person. Lose questions if they're just as bad as Bellows. They're both in the in-between because they were saving their families, and Bella says she's trying to save humanity. Don't these feelings come from the same place? And Papa Titan is like, what the actual f are you saying right now? Of course not. Bella's real goal doesn't come from a genuine place. He only wants to be the hero in his own delusions. He fears what he can't control. Papa Titan's magic is fading away, but he uses his last bit of life to bring Luz back. Will she choose herself? She chooses and gets a temporary power boost. 
He whispers something for Luce to tell King, and then descends into the depths as a skeleton. The Hex Squad, they wake Camilla up, and the archives start falling apart. The gang's magic is failing, because magic in general is failing. Camilla says Luz is too stubborn to let all of this get her down, she must be fine. And Camilla also points out that they can still use glyphs, which they use to get the puppets down. Gus's palisman almost gets hurt, but Hunter prevents that, he won't let any more palismen be damaged. Eden and King fight belts more, but they don't do so well. Collector tries to get them to leave because he doesn't want to lose anyone else. Bellus's decay infects the Collector, but doesn't really harm them too much. Bellus almost crushes them, but is stopped by Luz in a titan hybrid form with fangs and longer hair and horns and glyphs all around her. I love this design. She surrounds Ida and King and gets them away while the Collector goes to the archives. Ida tells Luz to concentrate so she can summon spell circles. She absolutely just launches magic all over the place. She and King went together. They went. So cool. Their titan magic causes the Bellows group to go away and red grass grows back. Kind of reminds me of the end of Shira when like all the grass was showing up. The titan starts standing up because that's how strong Bellows has gotten. The earthquake, or should I say titan quake, rocks the archives. The hex squad saves the puppets while a collector prevents the archives from collapsing altogether. They go up into the atmosphere while Luz's power starts to fade. They said, oh, they'll have to cut Bellows off from his magic supply. Magic comes from the heart, after all. They just launch to the castle. Rain is still there, Ida rescues them. They have some scars, but not as bad as Hunter. Luz flies up and pulls Bellows off the heart with Ida and King and Rain's help. We were all hoping for this callback and we got it. Do not underestimate me, I am the good witch Luz, eat this sucker. So fitting that Bellows is defeated by a human. All of his taint just crumbles and fades away. The Collector sets the Archives down, and Amity offers them a kind hand. The final bit of Bellows goes back to his human Philip appearance. He's like, Thank you for freeing me from this heinous curse that made me do all these things. Lose summons some boiling rain, and he just melts away. He says, oh, you're just as bad as those witches. Humans are better than this. Ida and Rain and King just step on their remains and finish him off for good. Obviously, no one was going to believe that he did it all because of a curse, but, you know, he went out the way he lived. The Titan power leaves Luz and fades away. She tells King the message Papa Titan had, which was, I loaf you. A bread pun. Hmm. The sun comes out and they're just laying on the grass. Everyone was freed from the archives. Steve hugs Lilith, Amity hugs Aldor, Gus hugs his dad, Willow hugs her dad. Hunter and Darius and Eber reunite. Eldalia was there standing off to the side. This is the very last we see of her. I hope they just punted her into the boiling sea. Principal Bump returns to Hexide with Cat and Amelia and Basha runs and hugs them. An older Lou starts narrating and is like, yeah, there's a lot of rebuilding to do. All the coven heads are pitching in whether they want to or not. Steve and the cats help clean up some rubble in Latissa with their wild magic and the old Coven members unmask and everyone puts their differences aside. The Collector brings everyone back to the Owl House, Luz and Amity kiss. Eden and Camilla finally meet and go in for a big family hug. Hootie returns with shining eyes, wraps around Lilith. The Collector decided to return to the stars because he has a lot of growing up to do, but King lets him keep Francois. I was not expecting that. The glyphs no longer work because direct titan magic is gone but Luz will always remember them, and at least she still has String Bean. Okay, we got the time skip, where are they now, epilogue. I had to rewatch this multiple times just to notice everything. It starts with older Luz and Camilla. Luz is packing her things, leaving for college. Kind of remind me of me when I head to the dorms. She's studying in the University of Wild Magic, taking all majors because, of course, Luz and the gang all have the same tattoo of Flapjack, and later we'll see that everyone on the aisles has some sort of Titan insignia on their clothing. Yeah, I wish Luz grew her hair out. I really like that look. We see a Luz and V graduation photo, one of Edith showing Camilla apple blood. The gang goes to Grom again. We see a scholarship signed by Dana Terrace, nice little Easter egg. Camilla has a similar earring to Reigns, which can be very overanalyzed. I'm not gonna do it here, but someone probably will. V's back. Hooray! She has longer hair and a Titan Earth shirt, which I know someone is gonna make and sell. And that pic in the background looks like she's playing baseball. Albert is there, and V is like, go get all the others. He flies over to the wooden shack, which now belongs to the Nosedas, and we see what everyone's doing on the aisles. There's a new portal door, which I think every time someone tries to open it, they're gonna hear the collector say, welcome to the boiling aisles. Albert flies with Willow, that image got leaked. She's got shorter hair, she flies over to the Palisman Forest, where Hunter's a Palisman Carver now, with the Bat Queen and the Clawthorns. Willow gives Hunter a big, tight hug, they go to Flapjack's graveyard. Rest in peace, Flapjack. Gone, but never forgotten. Hunter has a new palisman now. It's a blue jay. I don't know its official name. It'll probably be revealed at some point, but I've seen some people calling this palisman Waffles, which is adorable. 
Hey guys, I found out after I recorded this that Waffles is a canon name. Dana confirmed it. Good to know. Basha sells Grudgeby gear now. Lilith is constructing a museum addition to the library. Hootie is the curator. Matt and, surprisingly, Kiki are helping build. And finally, Lilith has her own harpy form. I've been waiting for that ever since Ida got her harpy form back in August 2021. Or was it July? No, I think that was her day of July 31st, so it was like practically August. Amity arrives on an abomination airship. She's got long hair on one side and shaved on the other and a ponytail. Albert flies past Hexide. Scar is teaching a lesson to some little kids. Barkus also seems to be working there. Bump is gardening, you know. Everyone's getting to do the little things they wanted to do. Elidor makes a device to remove Coven sigils. It's the kid from Covention that we saw when the sigils were like introduced to us. Rain's hair is now whitish. Albert shows up and is like, Stop what you're doing! Pressing matters are at hand! Rain has a new palace man. Emera has shorter hair. We see the Slither Beast and the South Indomus with their kids. The University of Wild Magic, which I'm pretty sure is built into the Grom Tree. I could be wrong, but... It looks like the Grom Tree. Hey y'all, another post-production edition. This is actually where Bellas' castle used to be. I'm not sure why I thought it was the Grom Tree. The two trees don't look alike at all. Also, the other basilisks are there too. I didn't notice them till editing because they blend into the background, but they're there, they're happy, all is right with the world. Edric and Patrick are there using equipment, the Looking Guest Graveyard guy is there, Gus teaches stuff from the Human Realm exchange program. I guess there is contact on both sides, maybe, who knows? Edith's the headmaster, her hair is long again, she has a hook hand. Perfect. King hasn't changed a whole lot, he's taller and fluffier and his horns are longer, but that's about it. He's organizing some party goers. Luz and company arrive and everyone says, Happy King Senyera! Since Luz spent her past few birthdays helping rebuild the Isles, she never had a proper King Senyera. They don't exactly get the cake right, but it's the thought that counts. That was quite delicious. The Echo Mouse is okay. You might remember last time I was saying that, you know, the Echo Mouse probably starved to death being in the outhouse all the time, but no, it's okay. Or maybe it's a different Echo Mouse, but I like to think it's the same one. King created his own glyph. His Titan powers are getting stronger. A whole new glyph language to try out. I may have to get that King Glyph as a tattoo on my other shoulder, because I've got the Bard Coven one here, and... Yeah, we got emptiness here. It's just waiting for another tattoo. The collector puts on a light show for everyone to see, and the show ends with everyone saying, Bye! Directly to the audience, pretty much. My favorite characters are King, he's so adorable, and V, she's so adorable. Look at my laptop sticker. I'll put a link in the description to where I bought that. Least favorite character, Odalia, obviously, but honestly, this went to such an extreme degree. Because there are characters that you just don't like, and then there are characters you dislike so much you wish you could enter the fictional universe and kill them yourselves. That's where it got for her. It's honestly a little concerning. That's right. Give in to your dark feelings. There is no escape. This is yet another show that got more plot heavy over time. I mean, it was always pretty plot heavy. But season one had some throwaway filler episodes. Luz is an excellent protagonist, she represents us. The fun, fantasy-loving type who doesn't always have it easy, but makes friends and has adventures along the way. She gives me hope that one day I'll have an awesome found family just like her. And as the great Lion Turtle once said, Darkness thrives in the void, but always yields to purifying light. Luz is that light, bringing joy into everyone's lives. Bellos is pretty much the anti-Luz, you know? He seems so strong and intimidating at first, but down below he's just a pathetic man-child, which is the opposite of how Lou started out really immature and grew over the show. He doesn't see himself as a villain, so he never thought anything he did was wrong. So many evil people are like that in real life, especially those who use religion as justification for their crimes. Even after death, he'll spend the rest of eternity in hell or whatever bad place exists in this universe, refusing to believe he was ever in the wrong. I genuinely believe he survived as long as he did by eventually becoming not alive. His spite was that powerful, he just transcended life. He didn't die when the Collector spited him because he wasn't alive. I like the Collector as the secondary villain, they're a fun character. The fun and games loving type who was left behind and just wanted a friend. Where have I seen that before? Thank you to Dana and all the other crew members and all the cast for making this magical adventure a reality. I hope that one day I could create something just as cool as this, but... Probably never be this cool. Seriously, I don't know if there will ever be another show quite like this for me. I certainly hope there is, but being part of this fandom as it's endured the hiatuses and reacted to all the memes old and new, 
and witness as it continued to grow was just so magical. I'm not sure if anything can replace that. I'll enjoy rewatching the show over and over and over. Screw Disney for making it shorter than it could have been. I'm glad that Dana is leaving Disney and is heading off to do great things elsewhere. Though allegedly the huge success of season 3 made Disney realize just how badly they judged the series, so maybe there will be more in the future. Disney Channel has brought shows back from the dead, so it's not impossible, but I wouldn't count on it. Especially since Dana wouldn't be involved, though Disney still owns the IP, so who knows. I think Disney Channel is going to be transitioning over to just posting on Disney+, Plus because like right now they're doing some hybrid thing where they like drop a batch of episodes on Disney+, Plus, then wait for them to air weekly, then drop more episodes, which I'm not a huge fan of that practice, but I think other people like it, so eh, whatever. I think the biggest unanswered question on the show is like the minor covens, which you saw in Covention. Like, apart from a single throwaway line in Labyrinth Runners, the show never again acknowledges Covens other than the main nine, or ten, I guess. I mean, I assume they're just subsidiaries, but who knows. And this is not an unanswered question, but we never got any sort of flashback with Caleb and Philip and Evelyn. It would have been nice just to get a good look at Evelyn. Just to, like, see what she really looks like, because, I mean, there's plenty of good fan art. But I kind of have my own thing where I, like, draw the heads of characters, and I was planning on doing another Owl House one. And I wanted to include Evelyn, but eh, am I going to have to invent how she looks just for this? Eh, maybe. I'm going to do a first versus last quotes video like I did for Amphibia and Avatar, and I want your opinion on something. The opening scene, is that Azura speaking, or is it just Lu since it's clearly Lu's voice and Azura is designed more like Lu's here? For a while, I just considered it Lu's first quote, but then thanks to them showed us footage from an Azura movie. So did that clip count as Azura's first quote, or Lu's? Also, that final bye will make things problematic, but I'll work with it. Happy Easter. It's Easter when I'm recording this, but it won't be when I upload it, but so. Belated Happy Easter. Like, comment, subscribe. Be gay, do witchcraft. Thanks for watching.